do not fear, for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. What a wonderful promise to claim on this beautiful sunny morning. And we welcome everyone who's come. Guten Morgen to our German visitors. It's lovely to have you with us, and we hope that you'll join us after the service in the hall for coffee. Just a reminder, we have no Zoom this evening. We are taking a three-month sabbatical, so we'll be back in September. Our special welcome to the Reverend Margaret Crawshaw, and we look forward to what she's going to share with us. Thank you to our musicians. It's always lovely to have them enriching the service. I'm going to light our peace candle, and then if you have a link, we'll say together the prayer on the front. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me, melt me, mold me, fill me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Really good to be with you again on this beautiful day. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul's words as he signs off in his second letter to the Corinthians and the earliest mention of the three persons of the Trinity together in a set form of words. Today is Trinity Sunday, the climax of the special Sundays before we go into the long period of so-called ordinary time. So we'll be looking at how the concept of the Trinity might be a helpful one for us. And it's also Environment Sunday. So I'll be attempting to weave some prayers and thoughts on our place in creation through the service too. But I want to begin with a beautiful prayer by Tom Schumann. Without you, weaver of willows, spinner of sunrises, I would have no place to put my foot stumbling face first into the mud puddles of my mistakes. Without you, retriever of the fallen, mediator of the sin splattered, I would have no place to put my soul, adrift on the stormy sea of seduction at the mercy of Bedlam's blows. Without you, Whisperer of wisdom, gift-bearing dove, I would have no place to put my heart, watching it shrivel in despair's bitter grasp. In you, I find my place. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessed Trinity, in you. Amen. And so we sing our first hymn, it's number 139, and I've been hearing the tune played as we've been preparing for worship, so I hope we'll manage it all right. Today I awake and God is before me.
And so let us pray. In the mystery of the beginning of things, creator God, you made this planet rock upon layer of rock to be weathered and planted, to become a place for living. In the mystery of human life, parent God, you made us flesh and blood and spirit and bone, image of yourself, woman, man and child for loving. In the mystery of your unconditional love, Redeemer God, you came in Jesus, flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone, to bring us back from our captivity, back to our true belonging, together, daughters and sons of heaven, living and loving here on earth. So here in this sacred place, place of celebration, of struggle and of safety, we rest, content or cautious, to know your presence, hear your word, sense your spirit welcoming us and waiting once again. And if, in the quiet, there come to mind the broken or the wounded bits of our lives and of our world, help us to name some of them before you now. And as you have shared our deepest sufferings, so may the glue of your transforming grace be for us and for our world amending once again. And if in this place it will come to pass once again, or perhaps for the very first time, that your spirit will touch ours, then in your mercy, turn us to face you, in ourselves, our world, our neighbour, and send us out from here, your companions on the way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we join together in the prayer Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So we sing again from Singing the Faith, number three. Eternal God, your love's tremendous glory cascades through life in overflowing grace.
And now Gerard will bring us um, our reading, which is from the Old Testament, but it's Trevor Dennis's version of Genesis chapter 1 from the Book of Books. In the beginning, before the world began, there was nothing. Nothing but God in the dark and the heap of water. And God's spirit like a fresh wind blowing like a wild bird flying. Then into the dark, God spoke. Let there be light, he cried. And there was. And God looked at the light and said, how beautiful you are. Your name is day. He looked at the darkness and said, your name is night. And there was morning and there was evening the world's first day. And so it went on. God spoke, God made, God split one thing from another. God gave things their names and put each in its proper place to be what it was meant to be, to do what it was meant to do. He made the sky and placed water above it for the rain. He made the sun the moon and the stars. He set them in the sky to mark the days and the nights by their shining and by their rise and fall to be a sign of the seasons of the year. He made the dry land and covered it with brambles and bananas, grasses and gooseberries, daisies daisies and dandelions, peaches and primroses, plants of every kind. He made the seas, oceans and rivers and filled them with porpoises and pilchards, triggerfish and turtles, halibut and harp seals, sperm whales and sticklebacks, swimming things of every kind. He made the currents of the air and filled them with kestrels and kingfishers, hummingbirds and hornbills, sandalings and shell duck, babblers and bulbuls, birds of every kind. He made the plains and hills and valleys and covered them with polar bears and pumas, reindeer and rhinoceros, hedgehogs and horses, aardvarks and antelopes, animals of every kind. The days went by and God looked at the creatures he had made He blessed them all and cried, how beautiful you are. Reproduce and multiply and fill the bright earth. On the sixth day, the day he made the animals, God said, let me make another creature to care for the earth with me. I will make human beings, men and women, girls and boys. They will be like me my image, my likeness, kings and queens on this, my fine earth. They will help me care for the fish, the animals, the birds, all the creatures that swim in the depths or run upon the land or ride upon the tall air. So God made them, like himself he made them, in his very image, his very likeness, boys and girls, women, Stretching his hand over them, he blessed them and said, Reproduce and multiply. Fill the earth and have it for your kingdom. See, I have given you all the food you need. I have given food for all my creatures, as many plants as you all want to fill your stomachs with. Then God looked at everything he had made. Behold, it was very beautiful. So very good. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. He made that day a holiday, a holy day, a day of holy rest for himself and all that he had made. How beautiful everything was. How very good. All was good. All was good.
all was good. We sing hymn number 727. God in his love for us lent us this planet. And now Mary will bring us our gospel reading for today. Our gospel reading comes from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. A very familiar passage, the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told him to, them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the earth. This is the gospel of Christ. Thanks to Christ our Lord. Trinity Sunday. Well, rather than tie myself in knots trying to explain the doctrine of the Trinity, I thought it might be more helpful to explore something of the nature of God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit. And the way I want to do that is through the threefold attributes contained in those words we call the grace. The words that I began the service with, words that we often say at the end of worship or a meeting. The words with which Paul ends his second letter to the Corinthians the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. But first, just a few words about this term, Trinity. 
as you probably know, the word doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. Um, but there are a few incidents in the Gospels when we see Father, Son, and Spirit all involved. Uh, one example is at Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan, where we have the voice of the Father speaking to the Son and the Holy Spirit coming down as a dove. In chapters 14 to 17 of John's Gospel, the latest of the Gospels to be written, we get perhaps the deepest understanding of the intimacy of the relationship between Father, Son and Spirit, where Jesus says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And he goes on to speak of the Holy Spirit as a helper who issues from the Father and whom the Father will send in my name. And this intimate relationship is captured well in Rublev's icon of the Trinity, which we've had on the screen during our service, where Father, Son and Spirit are in perfect harmony, connected one to another in this circle by loving gazes and graceful gestures. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, in that reading, Mary just brought us, we find the phrase, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's being used in connection with baptism, which probably reflects the liturgical practice in Matthew's own church community. So all of these passages show that the idea of one God as Father, Son, and Spirit isn't too far from the pages of the New Testament. But well, let's come now to the words of the grace. And first, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the most gracious, most graceful people I've ever met is Archbishop Elias Shakur. He's the Melkite Archbishop of Galilee. I was privileged to meet him on a visit to Palestine and Israel some years ago. He has written, and I'd read his books before I met him, he's written of his experience as a child in 1947, of what the Palestinians call the Nakba, the catastrophe. When his family welcomed Israeli soldiers into their home and gave them hospitality, before they were tricked out of their house and left to fend for themselves in the woods outside their village, when they eventually received permission to return on Christmas Day 1951, they found it was another trick as their village was blown up and demolished in front of them. They were never allowed to return, as was the, the situation for thousands of Palestinians, of course. Instead, a new Jewish settlement was established next to the ruins of their village. And you would expect someone who's gone through that kind of experience and knowing of the suffering of so many others to be very bitter. But, in fact, he has a complete lack of bitterness. He has a continued generosity towards Jewish Israelis and he makes remarkable efforts towards peace and bridge building between the two communities who used to be like brothers. His book is called Blood Brothers. All these, I think, are marks of grace. He learnt from his own father, but he also learnt from the one he calls the man from Galilee. The one he often shared his troubles with as a boy on the Galilean hills. The one who taught him that self-righteousness and anger would get him nowhere the one who called him, as he calls us, to love his enemies and to be a peacemaker. The Apostle Paul, who ends most of his letters with the phrase, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you, knew what it was too to experience that grace for himself. Because of course he had been a persecutor of the church until he met with Jesus on the road to Damascus. 
And as we too experience God's grace for us, we can learn like Paul, like Archbishop Shakur, to show that same grace in our dealings with others. So after the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come next to the love of God, the love of God the Father. I'm sure we all know the verse John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But we don't have to wait for the New Testament and the incarnation to see the love that God has for the world the creation story in Genesis tells us that with each act of creation, God was pleased with what he saw. Or as Trevor Dennis puts it, it was very beautiful, so very good. God loved and God blessed all the creatures of air and land and sea, including human beings who were to help care for all the other creatures. We see God's continuing love through, them, through the pages of the Old Testament. Even though the relationship is often marred by human disobedience, God's love is like the best kind of parents' love. Lays down guidelines, but allows us the freedom to make our own decisions and our own mistakes. Is saddened when we make a mess of things, but is always ready to welcome us back, to forgive and start again. And when we get to the story of Jesus, we see just how deep and sacrificial God's love is. I find it very reassuring to know that this self-giving love is at the heart of the universe. And yet it's challenging too, because Again, this kind of love must also shape our attitudes and our behaviour to one another and to the whole of creation. If human beings are created in the image of God, then we must not only learn to love our neighbours, but also to exercise the dominion granted at creation in a way that reflects God's love and care for the earth and all living things. The third and final element of Paul's benediction is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Now, Methodists know a lot about fellowship. We're very fond of our women's fellowships and our men's fellowships and fellowship over a cup of tea at the end of a service. At its most diluted, it could come to mean just getting together for a chat, perhaps with like-minded people. But of course, it actually means something much, much deeper than that. The word translated as fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, which literally means partnership. It's to do with a deep communion, either with God or with others, on equal terms. And it is indeed the work of the Holy Spirit to bring this about. It's the Holy Spirit who could bring a disparate band like the first disciples together in a common mission to the world. It's the Holy Spirit who can enable Christians of different denominations, indeed people of all faiths, to work together. It's the Holy Spirit who can mould a local church with all its different viewpoints and personalities into one body in Christ with every part of the body valued and functioning at full capacity. I think this is true fellowship. And if we are made in the image of God, and if God can be perceived as a fellowship or communion of equal persons, then what does this have to say about human identity? Is who we are a matter of relationship? Rather than being simply autonomous individuals, are we only truly ourselves in and through our loving relationships with others? 
There's a story in The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky about an old woman and an onion. The old woman was in hell, but because she'd done one good deed, an angel let down an onion on a rope to rescue her. As she was being pulled up, others clung to her to be rescued as well. But when she said, it's my onion, not yours, the onion snapped in two and she fell back into the lake of fire. It's a good story, isn't it? <laughs> Certainly, I think it's in our relationships with others and in the quality of those relationships that people will catch glimpses of the God we serve. The challenge to us, I think, is not to explain or even fully understand the doctrine of the Trinity, but to reflect the love, the grace, and the deep fellowship within the Godhead at every level of our relationships, amongst our family and friends, within the church, across all religious and other divides, and perhaps especially the most difficult with those we dislike or disagree with. So may the intertwining grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be truly with us all. So we're going to sing from Singing the Faith 687, 687, One Human Family God Has Made, and this goes to a beautiful folk tune.
Dear Lord, we ask you to bless these and all the gifts we offer, that they may be used in your service. Amen. And now we come to our pray prayers of thanks and of concern. So let us pray. We thank you, Creator God, that the word you spoke and keep speaking is the life, the sustenance of all that is, seen and unseen. We thank you, Jesus, that the life you gave and keep giving is the recreation, the renewed birth of every broken and wounded creature. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that the breath you breathed and keep breathing is the inspiration for creativity, compassion and community that connects and unites all that God has made. Life-giving, life-restoring, life-fulfilling God, we thank you and offer you our hearts and minds to join in your ongoing work of caring, connecting, and creating community. Amen. So now we pray for a world that desperately needs you, God. When powers struggle for dominance and war, oppression, and abuse result, when groups of people oppose one another because of ideology, religion or culture, we need a God who is bigger than ourselves and our personal interests. And so we pray for President Putin and for the people of Ukraine suffering in a war not of their making. For the people of Sudan caught up in a military power struggle. For a polarised Turkey where President Erdogan has just been re-elected after two decades in power. For Palestinians suffering severe and growing oppression by a right-wing Israel. And for indigenous and marginalised people everywhere. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. When people are disregarded and devalued because of poverty, geography or disease, when compassion and justice is withheld to some because of sexuality, race or gender, we need a saviour who is more compassionate than we are who includes even those we would exclude. And so we pray for the people of Malawi struggling to feed their families, for Iran, Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia where women and girls are denied their rights. And in Pride Month we pray for Uganda and all countries where people's sexuality or gender identity can lead to violence or death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. When resources are mismanaged and abused and the world and its creatures are destroyed, when motivation is scarce and creativity is in short supply to address the challenges that we face. We need a spirit who is more powerful and more creative than we could ever be. And so we pray for the Pacific Island nations, for the rainforests, for the Fair Trade Foundation, for Arosha, and all environmental groups seeking to reverse climate change and protect biodiversity. 
and we pray too for all the victims of the triple train crash in India this weekend. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, loving Saviour, empowering Spirit, we offer you these prayers and all the prayers of our hearts because we know our need of you. Captivate us, call us and fill us that we may be carriers of your eternal life to this world that you love so dearly. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 611, 611. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. So may we go to live as connected and connecting followers of Jesus. And may the blessing of God, creator, redeemer and inspirer, rest upon us today and all our days. Amen.